Shorba Shokti Manala, Amda Tomaranam Prasham Shakori, Amda Dandaba, D. A. D. Nerejono, A. Class Nerejono, Amda Dandaba, D. Ibon Porishon Akori, J. Tumi Amadek Te, Tomar Shahad Jodal, Shom Amra Monajat Kori, Dokori, Allah Name Chai, Amen. Well, today's lectures are particularly interesting to me in that it spans the early period of Muslim and Christian dialogue um, from the 8th to the 11th centuries, then jumps to the 18th and 19th centuries. Some of the best uh, Western observations about Islam it seems to me are, are, are often made by people of the least faith, the Orientalists. So I shall quote them and rest good favor of uh, both Muslims and Christians. But the reason they're interesting is because they went direct to the original sources of both Islam and Christianity and compared them. And I think fairly dispassionately. Um, more often, they're dispassionate observations from living with Muslims and studying their texts and their preservation of these texts and ideas paints a backdrop of history for both Muslims and Christians. And those of us who, us who have a living faith in dialogue uh, are able to understand the texts better. History is like a backdrop. And it gives us a sense of why issues were discussed between Muslims and Christians. And unfortunately, history itself is often problematic with wars taking place by Christian crusaders and um, Muslim armies. My, my professor, at university would often say with sadness that with Christians, the cross follows the flag. And on the Muslim side, the Quran often followed the, the armies of Islam. And that too needs to be part of our story today. I count it an honor that um, you might participate with me in this, in this discovery. I hope that in the end, uh, we have a few friends left. But I most hope that in our study of the Quran in the Bible, we do not do disservice to God, Allah, or to this very important segment of his story. I personally learned about Islam mostly from friends in Bangladesh. Uh, and I've never lost the joy of mutually sharing our respective faiths. At a much earlier period, I studied Arabic, visiting Cairo eight times over many years. And as a boy, I rested in the great mosques and shrines with others seated on the marble floor in the back and not trying to not bother those who came for prayer. In a sense, we were all there and not resting in a restaurant because we loved God, we loved Allah, and needed to rest in a place of veneration of the Lord, apart from the worldly and, worldly and secular life in the market. Seated in the back one day, I, I was approached by an old Muslim scholar who wished to communicate to me why to pray more than the set rules of zakat. He, he exhorted, seek God. You find what you seek. Wise words. And I was reminded of Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I paused and prayed. And that's been my journey. Well, as I mentioned to you before, uh, one of two objectives in dialogue were 
were determined by one of two methods. The first objective was to gain superiority, and that was employed by logical dialectic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis in argumentation. The, sec the second objective was to gain an adherent employed by admitted truths. If you can remember, you conceptualize two circles and where they intersect, the area of those circles in common are what we call admitted truths. Well, the Crusades was the first, um, was the first problem, you might say, to draw a curtain across the opportunity to use admitted truths. And it was also one of the first reasons why dialogue began to shift from the Middle East to India. Now, per Pope Urban, uh, at the, in the Roman church at that time, had in the 8th century, had no positive regard for, uh, sorry, 11th century, had no positive regard for Muslims and called for, quote, cross wars from the 10th century on to retake the Holy Land. And the Crusades, they were actually heavily embarked on in the 11th, but the thought from the 10th. The Crusades indelibly changed the nature of constructive missionary dialogue or any dialogue using admitted truths, which had been built up between Muslim and Oriental Christians. And from the time of the Crusades, most discussions from that point onward between Muslims and Christians were held along the lines of logical dialectic to prove the other arguments wrong. Another factor, so, so the first factor that discouraged dialogue using admitted truths, of course, was the Crusades. One was the migration of Muslim thinkers to India following the Mongol invasion of the Middle East during the 13th century. The Mongol invasion, at least as much as the Crusades discouraged um, dialogue because the great thinkers uh, were devastated. For example, Baghdad, as you, as you might remember in our previous discussion, Baghdad was the home and the repository of um, the greatest library then known to the world in, in, in Baghdad. They had they had copied the ancient Greek manuscripts um, and un under Harun al-Rashid, they had begun the establishment of this fabulous library, also a fabulous irrigation system between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So when the Mongols came through, Genghis Khan came through the Middle East, the first thing he did he destroyed the library. He understood the foundation, the nucleus, the locus of Islamic thought was in the library. He destroyed it. Then he turned to the agriculture, what, what made that whole land prosperous. And then he destroyed the irrigation system. He, he had that, he stopped his armies for two years while they bricked up the, the irrigation system. And so that was the second issue. And the third uh, reason that Muslim and Christian dialogue shifted to India was that during the Ottoman rule, during the 16th centuries, that's obviously several centuries later, that interfaith re uh, relations were, were, were proscribed. And so you had those three factors, the Crusades, the Mongol invasion, and finally the Ottoman rule. And all of those factors shifted the locus of Muslim and Christian dialogue and also Islamic study to a great extent to India.
Very early on, of course, Muslim rule was established in India in certain parts following the conquest of Sindh in, in 711. And um, the Islamic car, uh, armies captured Sindh in 711. And that began the, um, as I said, the slogan became the Quran followed the Islamic army. And from that point on, uh, the gateway was open toward Islamic thought as well. But a spiritual invasion followed that, which was actually more important. And that was the Sufi mystics who came from Persia largely, largely, but other uh, uh, countries in the Middle East as well to India. And the Sufi teachers fled from Persia to India during the persecution caused by the Mongol ruler Genghis Khan in, in 1220. And as they came to India, they integrated their thought with Hinduism and Buddhism and a Sufi form of Sunni Islam, very mystical. And, um, but it was very contextualized Islam at, in that early period. Eventually, under the Mughals, India be, uh, became the heart of a great Islamic empire and a prolific center of Islamic culture and learning. Now, all of the Mughal emperors were not of the same um, theological orientation, let's put it that way. Remember, the earlier ones, you're going to expect to have to integrate their thought into a very Hindu culture, and so it was. Uh, for example, you get to Akbar, who we all remember, and Akbar was, in a sense, he, he ruled from 1556 to 1605. In a sense, Akbar was very, very syncretistic. Um, he was a strong personality, a successful general, and most of all, he was a broad thinker in religions. And um, he had... He had a kind of Sunni, Sufi orientation, but it was very syncretistic. And he was able to adopt other religions and allow other religions to flourish during his period. Of course, that was attractive to his subjects, especially his non-Muslim subjects. So you had Akbar. Now, after Akbar, <clears throat> Jahangir, was more Shiite. And the Shiite faith was more amenable toward understanding other faiths within Islam. So you had, you had Jahangir from 1605 to 1627. And the pendulum began from under Akbar to Shiism under the younger Jahangir. And then it swung yet again from a liberal, from Jahangir who was Shiite to, um, I didn't show you Jahangir there. That's, that's Akbar, by the way. And um, Akbar was very, he was very syncretistic, though it, at his heart of hearts, I think he would have been a, a, a Sunni, but a very liberal one. And then from Akbar, the pendulum swung again under um, to, to Shah Jahan, who was Shiite, very liberal Shiite. And then from Shiite, Shah Jahan, to reactionary Aurangzeb, he was he was quite strict, and so you see how the the um, within Islam you had a swing from syncretism to conservative Sunnism.
at that point into the British. And um, the British period entered, uh, came, came into uh, its own um, in the 17th century. And the British began as traders. And then they, from trading, they began to administer the trade routes for the British government. They were not the only ones, by the way. There was also the French at the same time and the Dutch. And they all saw India as a possible place for, not only a possible place for trade, but a place where they could become really um, a point for leverage worldwide for trade. And so the French entered India and they aligned themselves with, um, with Shiraz uh, Dalla, the, the Muslim governor of um, Bengal. Well, that, that set up a conflict between the French interests and the British interests. And that conflict eventually erupted and the British fought the French at the Battle of Plassey and were victorious. That's 1757. What happened really was that Siraj Dalla was the real loser there because the British took over his entire holdings in Bengal. Bengal at one point became a real seat, not only of governance, but it did become that. But of learning, the, the um, for example, when the British came into Bengal, they established Calcutta as an artificial city for governance. Governance of what? Well, they had already put their tentacles out throughout India, but also they had holdings in Hong Kong. They had holdings in parts of Africa. And do you know at one point, Calcutta became the administrative uh, point for the British Empire, eventually, in all of their holdings, and Calcutta itself published more books than Paris and London combined. It became that influential in terms, first of all, administration for the British, secondly, in terms of learning, and some of the great universities um, began at Calcutta for India and then moved elsewhere. But um, the Battle of Plassey, 1757, became a very important point in governance of India from there on out. The British East India Company eventually took over British India and the interests of the entire country. Here, here, I'm going to show you the, the, the uh, British East India Company flag. Do, do not mistake it for the Union Jack alone, but that was the British East India Company flag. And the British East, East India Company rule in India was from 1757 to 1858, almost 100 years. And following the India, the Indian Rebellion of 1857, the Government of India Act in 1858 led to the British crowns assuming the direct control of the Indian subcontinent in the form of the new British Raj. Well, you can ask yourself the question, who benefited? from this British rule. You know, there is a very apt saying that um, efficient rule, perhaps good rule, is not the same as home rule. And eventually home rule is more important. But what were the benefits and costs of the British rule? Well, the benefits. First, 
It brought order and stability to India, a society badly divided by civil war. Not only were there the British and the French and the Dutch vying for India, but within India itself, there was the Muslims, there were the Hindus, and so forth. So there was religious division, there was social and political division, and um, India had not had as much actually stability and, and order as they had before the British. It led to a fairly honest and efficient government. And um, Lord Thomas Macaulay sets up a new school system with the goal to train Indian children to serve in the government and the army. You, you can tell there was a definite focus there on what would benefit British India. The railroads and telegraphs and post postal systems, and that is the jewel in the crown for both India and and uh, the British. The railroads and telegraph and postal systems, as well as education, became the hallmarks of the British contribution. The costs were very high, huge. Well, first of all, the school system and the, and the educational system, which was undoubtedly a huge asset, served only the elite, upper-class Indians in 90% of the Indian population remained illiterate. Secondly, the Indians did not benefit economically, and that was the big takeaway. Even if not all of the populace would have been, had a, um, a cut in the education, if they could have prospered, I believe that the British period would have extended itself. But the British manufactured goods um, were prosperous to the wealthy because they received the proceeds, but it destroyed local industries that prior to the British period uh, had been the backbone of the local farmer, the local tea plantation, the, the benefits previously was, was more localized following the British most of the money went to um, went to the the, uh, the well-to-do, and British taxes on Indians, though modest by most standards, uh, were very hard on the poor people. And the British rule, most of all, um, was degrading. The best jobs, the housing reserved for the British. And the Indian, Indians felt they were being treated as inferiors to the British. So you can see the pluses, the minuses, and eventually the, um, the minuses in the heart of the Indians rose to the surface. Let's, let's just take a look, though, at some of the big benefits, which, which the, bit, uh, oh, my, my slides are jumping all over the place. I've got to find, find them again. So what I was saying is that let's look at some of the benefits that uh, we, we, we see under the British. Well, the university system, the oldest educational institute in India, is still functional. Sar Sarampore College in Howrah, West Bengal, how often I've been there. It's a lovely university. It was founded in 1818 by a trio of Eng English missionaries, William Carey, Joshua Marshman, and, and William Ward. And um, the college still churns out thousands of graduates every year. It's a beautiful university. Um, another that was quite important was in 1847, 
there was Thomason College. It was established to become a civil engineering college. And now it's a university with a broad uh, educational spectrum. So that's just two of the, there is Muir College. And as we will see, one was eventually established um, by, by Sir Saga uh, Ahmed Khan, the uh, Muslim College, the Anglo-Muslim College, latterly named has been changed to uh, the, the Muslim University. And that's a very prominent college as well. Well, of course, there were the universities and roads, railroads are were, uh, really were important. Railroads, bridges, and roads established across British India. Nowhere else has a railway system built during British India been so indelibly connected with the image of the nation. Just as there is no single country on earth that has such a broad cultural, ethnic, and racial mix as India, there is also no other railway system that has played and crucially continues to play such a fundamental role. India moves by its rails, so, so does Bangladesh. Our culturally, culture heavily depends upon the railroad. Also, the Indians introduced large tea plantations. Heretofore, tea had been planted, uh, especially in Ceylon, in Assam, in um, uh, parts of East and West Bengal. But the British introduced the tea culture, provided a market, and provided means to get tea in, in large bulk to these markets. And um, they really began to rival China with the export of tea. So that was a cash crop. And a lot of the money filtered down, but still, remember, it's taking away from the small landowners who previously had, had, had grown tea. Well, those who benefited, those who benefited tolerated English governance and British life, enjoyed British life. But um, there were a lot of people who did not benefit from English rule. And you see that slogan, e efficient rule is no substitute for home rule, but rather led to humiliation and struggle. Here is a British uh, soldier and they're doing their mapping land ostensibly so the British can take over some of that land. And you see the landowner there with his head bowed. And he understood he has to submit. And I think this efficient rule was not a substitute for home rule, but it led to humiliation and struggle from there. The humiliation is a very big, big uh, issue in Asia. And there's a system of honor. And this is something that as we Westerners don't comprehend, but it's very, I'm, my DNA really is Bangladesh. I'm a Bangladeshi, I'm a and I speak Bengali better than English. And I understand this, this issue of honor. And it's something that even though goods and services were in more abundance and the lifestyle improved, efficient rule was no substitute for home rule. Well, there's also another expression that Muslims often said, it's, it's, it's a Persian expression, a Persian proverb, a Muslim ruler is better, though he oppress me, than a kafir, an unbeliever, though he give me prosperity. And we see how this began, this begins to engender strife between communities, cultures, 
ethnicities, religions, and finally, the, those who govern and those who, who serve. And here we have the beginning of the anger, the subservience that led to Indian, the Indian mutiny of 1857, which of course began in, as, uh, in the army, in the Indian army itself, and then spread throughout the country. Actually, there were a few slides I, I deleted because they were showing um, actually how, how people were killed on both sides. And I, I finally couldn't show it. But many people would have lost their lives had not this man intervened. Syed Ahmed Khan saved the lives of many British in the Indian Mutiny of 1857. Uh, he argued, and, and he did it by reason. First, he personally intervened. That battle that you just saw was going on. And he interposed his negotiating skills with his faith, his Islamic faith. And this is what he argued. He argued that India was not Dar al-Islam, the land of Islam. There were too many kafirs, too many infidels, too many people who did not believe in Islam. He said, it is not either Dar al-Har, the land of struggle. It is simply British India, where Muslims were protected, and as such, Dar al-Amin or Dar al-Zimma, that is a home for security and, and of protection for the, for, the, for the Muslim Indians. So he's arguing they should accept British rule as it protects Muslims in India, in a predominantly Hindu society. And in so arguing, that, that argument was ultimately understood. And he saved not hundreds, but thousands of lives. Well, Saiga, a little more about Sayyid Ahmed Khan and who he was, we'll, we'll see more about him. But uh, he was a judge at Bij Bijnor when the mutiny broke out. And during the anxious weeks um, that followed the outbreak of the, of the revolt, British men, women, and children remained in Bijnor. And Khan did all within his power to make them stay, uh, uh, safe. After this war, after 1857, after that revolt, and when it was put down, John's, uh, Sir, uh, Sir John Strachey, Lieutenant Governor of the, of the Northwest Provinces, said of Khan in a speech at Aligarh on the 11th of December, 1880, no man ever gave nobler proofs of conspicuous courage and loyalty to the British government than were given by him in 1857. No language that I could use would be worthy of the devotion he showed. So the greatest effect which the Indian rebellion had on Muslim and Christian dialogue, unfortunately, was to widen the chasm between the two cultures though. Khan could, could, could not bring that together. He helped stop the fighting. Uh, but the chasm had already grown to such an extent that he alone couldn't do that. He couldn't bring, the, bring them together. And in turn, that caused the polarization uh, between the, to the faiths. So he and Sir William Muir sought for a way to bring the cultures together. Otherwise, they both knew there would be further flashpoints. And um, they finally found the way best forward was through education. And Muir supported, Sir William Muir supported Khan in his plan for a Muslim university at Aligarh, the Anglo-Mohammedan Oriental College 
of Aligar was later to be called as it is today, Aligar Muslim University. And Mir was asked by Khan to give that inaugural address of the college. And one reason was is because he facilitated, Mir facilitated the land on which the college was built. And I believe it was Sir John Strachey that facilitated funds given toward that, that college. But they both understood, both Mir and Khan understood the way to bring the Muslim communities together was through universities, through school systems, through education. And so they began on that project. It's interesting to me, it's, it's India became the repository since the, the Mongol invasion for many, many manuscripts from the Middle East being preserved in India. For example, Al-Waqidi's manu uh, manuscript on the biography of the prophet was preserved in India. And it was on that, as well as Asayuti's manuscript that Sir William Muir eventually wrote his life of Muhammad. And so these manuscripts actually were spirited out of the Middle East. As you might remember, we mentioned that the Grand Library at Baghdad was, was destroyed. And so these manuscripts often found their way by traders to India. And it was a third party that began to study the study these manuscripts. Um, I suppose you might consider Muir a kind of Orientalist, though he was a Christian, a personal Christian, a man of faith. But um, the the uh, the Orientalists, generally speaking, were not identified as people of faith, but like Professor G. A. Balin, uh, a, a Finnish Orientalist from 11, uh, 1811 through 1852, studied Arabic and Persian, lived in the Middle East, looked like a Muslim, doesn't he? Very much like one, he was an Orientalist. And he helped define Islam from, a, from original sources. He, he was a great scholar. Almost always do, do you see a portrait of him with it, or image of him with, a, with a, a, a manuscript. And the observations of Orientalists received, because they're describing Islam scientifically from the outside, rather than as a Muslim from the inside, they received qualified acceptance by liberal Muslims who understood the value of uh, rigorous textual study but often outright rejection by Orthodox Muslim scholars. Nevertheless, to gain, an, um, to gain entrance into the study of the text, we owe them a lot because they, they found the text often that were in private libraries throughout India and um, Sir William, Sir William Muir was very instrumental in finding texts. And uh, then they put them in libraries, they had them copied, they studied them. So we owe much to them. And I'm going to take a look at the um, um, analyses of the Orientalists. First of all, they were interested in, in what, what was said about uh, Allah. Of course, they, they did their textual study, and we will come back to that in detail um, in my next lecture on this coming Thursday. But always they began with text, context, and then usage. So you can always look for their, uh, their, their outline. Um, linguistically, they, they began the study of Allah, for example, comparing 
the Hebrew word for God, which is El, and the Arabic word for God, which is Eel. And then um, as you have a cognate language of Aramaic, you had El Eloha, Allah, and then in Aramaic, it's Allaha. You can hear the similarity between the Hebrew Eloha, the Arabic Allah, and the Aramaic Allaha. For example, Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. He read Hebrew. One doesn't know if he would have understood Arabic or not. But anyway, you can see how he read about God in Hebrew. In singular, it's Eloha. In the plural, it's the honorific plural, Elohim. And then the Aramaic, which he spoke, he would have spoken Allah for God. And then he would have understood if anyone would have said Allah as being the deity God, the same that, that he read in the Old Testament. So you see, the Orientalists were first defining God linguistically, and then by text, and then by usage. Now, by text throughout the Quran and the Old Testament, New Testament, they would have noticed, uh, Old Testament especially, it's like Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. The unity of God is the primary way to define the deity in the Old Testament. It, it is also so in the Quran. So, and then by usage, the Orientalists note that the key idea is submission to Allah. Submission is rooted in, in a sense of dependency on Allah God. Submission to God includes the ideas, the forms, the ethics, the worship. Here you can see worship at the, at the Juma Masjid in Delhi. And so you had, you had this, the Orientalist study, Islam, comparing it very much to Hebrew thought, and I think there's much to learn here. And uh, they they expanded their ideas on the forms in which that Allah could could be personified. In other words, in the Hindu culture in which Islam came, the gods and goddesses were personified in in an idol form, a figure form, but in Islam, not so. And in calligraphy, in shapes, in beautiful architecture that, that helps cast your mind upward, the unity of God is expressed, but not in a figurine. You find the same idea in Judaism, and they made that, that correlation. So the Orientalists themselves and how they were studying the deity in Islam and Christianity, uh, Islam and Judaism saw bridges, and gradually they began to form an idea here, which to them was borne out eventually in their studies, and that was that Islam, though post-Christian in time, it came after Christianity, was pre-Christian in thought. It was Jewish in thought. And that became a presupposition. We can go on. Now, remember, India became a repository for some of the great lives of the prophets. And um, the Orientalists 
were particularly interested in this because it gave us a window and it gave them a window. We gave us a window through them and through the early writings of, of the, the biographies, biographies of the prophets. And uh, you find this true of, of course, I mentioned before, um, Wakiti. In Wakiti's manuscripts, were, were lost from the ninth century and, and finally they were rediscovered in, in India. And then you had Sayuti's manuscripts and they were found in India again. Of course, there were manuscripts that were in the Middle East of Asayuti. Anyway, all these painted a portrait that the West had not seen of the prophet. And for the first time, the Orientalists showed how the Arab prophet's message combined religious ideas and regulations with reform. And he, Muhammad himself as a person is described in, especially Wakini, was looked upon as the first effective re reformer among the Arabs. And he contrasted with the society into which he was born, which had, which had its roots in Arab tribal life. Can you see how important this was in, in India in, when, in which a type of Islam took, took very strong hold? Because India was very much a palette of religions like perhaps the Arab uh, the Arabs had been with their paganism. And as Islam came into Arabia, it also came into India and introduced the idea of the unity of God, of the one God, and actually reforming much in the culture. So this, this became a very important aspect. And another important aspect that we have to look at is that the Orientalists noted that in Mecca, the prophet was a warner prophet. He came to warn about paganism. And of course, this was indelibly true in India. Mecca, Muhammad's birth, birthplace, was a pagan cult, cultish city honoring the Kaaba with the, with, the black, with the black stone, the worship of which he denounced. It's interesting that, it, that, that the Kaaba was cleansed, as it were, and remains to this day a rather unmeaning shroud on a vibrant faith surrounding the one deity alone. So, the Orientalists were pointing out Muhammad originally had meditations about eschatological images. And he had a keen sense, as did some of the prophets of old, Old Testament prophets, of the end of the world, of people going to hell. And he came as a warner. And Muhammad's call to repentance and submission derives first and foremost, from his feeling that they were living in the last times, the last days, and the end of the world is near. And I think he felt that because of the idolatry surrounding them. As Islam came to India, many of the Indian divines who were Islamic had that sense that if India continued, along its idolatrous path, it was facing the judgment of God. So there was a definite distinction which the Orientalists made about the Meccan surahs where he came as a warner and the Medinan surahs. Let's, let's look at a little more about this category of the Medinan surahs now.
Well, again, the Mekansuras hold um, that the Oedalists held that the Mekansuras stem from the first third of the prophet's activity uh, during his first 10 years in Mecca, warning them to turn from idolatry. And the Mekansuras also brought a social message complaining about the oppression of the poor, about the greed, about dishonesty, about indifference to man's higher concerns and duties in life, to what is good and enduring in contrast to worldly pleasures, Quran 1846, Surah 1846. Now, um, they point out, and I believe you'll find this in Muir's life as well, his is a translation of Wakiti, by the way. So Wakiti em emphasizes this also, that in Mecca, Muhammad was a follower of Abraham, warning to turn away from idolatry, Surah 1594. And he went to Medina. However, this, this particular message did not go over well. Why? Well, not only was Mecca important um, to the Meccans, as the Kaaba being there as a focal point for Arab idolatry, but many places in the world, pilgrims would come every year for 30 days to worship at, at the Kaaba. And it was a source of income. So from a religious perspective and a business perspective, the prophet's message was harming their spiritual orientation toward idolatry and harming their business. And when you have both of those factors against you, you're facing grave difficulty, po uh, politically as well as religiously, as well as business. And eventually in 622, Muhammad had to depart from the city. So he went to Medina. Now, if, if you remember that he assumed in, in Mecca, he was a warner to turn back to God. Now in Medina, he assumed a different He assumed the rule of the restorer of the religion of Abraham. And um, you might say in Mecca, Muhammad was a warner prophet. In Medina, he became a warrior prophet. He organized the faithful. He promulgates a civil and religious war um, for the organizations and uh, that is taking shape. He provides rules, regulations, and practical circumstance of life. So the faith was organized. In Medina, the Quran is declared to be a miraculous book communicated by the prophet, the supreme miracle, proving that he was, his was truly a divine mission. And the Quran at that point becomes the foundation for the religion of Islam, its scripture, its revealed document. Now, I'm giving you this version, not from me, more from the Orientalist perspective. I do think it has some correct analysis. The succeeding triumphs of the prophet and his successors strengthen this belief in him and in the, and in the book, which he... Uh, which he brought. Polemics against uh, both Jews and Christians occupy a part of the Medanese surahs. So the Meccan surahs, you're going uh, have more a warning against judgment that's impending, and in the Meccan surahs, Medinan surahs, you have um, organization of the faithful and polemics against those who are not faithful. And that would, would have been considered the Jews and the Christians. And a, a different watchword in the Meccan surahs became in like surah 2, 244, 
a different watchword was used, fight the, uh, fight the idolaters in the way of God. And so it's typified more by, as the Orientalists would suggest, by a struggle which must go on until God's word is supreme. So you see how the Quran was looked at in both the Medinan surahs as opposed to the Meccan surahs. And uh, then from that, in Medina, in Medina, the most important aspect, he, uh, the Orientalist feel, was the definition of the five pillars of Islam. For example, the Shahada, profession of faith, is, is clearly defined in the Medinan period. Prayer, the ritual of prayer, almsgiving, zakah. It's previously in the Medinan surahs had been more voluntary, but later became um, a defined contribution, a fixed amount. Fasting, um, originally on, 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 the, on the 10th day of the first month, it's more or less an imitation of the Jewish Day of Atonement, or Ashura. Later became Ramadan, the ninth month in the lun lunar calendar. And finally, the pilgrimage to, to the Kaaba, and, um, which became, it, it was cleansed, redefined, not a place of idolatry, those were cleansed, but a focal point of remembering the one true God. I suppose the and the uh, Orientalists suggest that it was a, the the uh, Kaaba itself became an unmeaning shroud over a living theism, a living monotheism. It's hard to explain. It's hard to explain the Kaaba. Finally, um, the Quran was re-examined by the Orientalists, interestingly, interestingly enough, in the context of the Christian Bible. And um, some Orientalists viewed Christian elements of the Quran as having reached Muhammad through the channel of apocryphal traditions, in other words, non-biblical traditions. Remember, they're looking for, they're not necessarily accepting it coming divinely inspired, as is the Orthodox Islamic belief. Other Christian Islamists, such as Muir, Goldsack, and others, um, as well as some liberal Muslims, incidentally, such as Sayyid Ahmed Khan, Chirag Ali, and others, um, held that Christian elements about God, Deuteronomy 6.4, for example, or Judaism, that elements in the New Testament about Jesus, Jesus born of a virgin, call God's word, his spirit, coming again at the last day as just judge, etc., came through uh, the New Testament to the Quran. And so they believed the Christian Islamists or Orientalists, as you might say, Orientalism normally is associated with, with, with not a, a, a living faith in, in God. But the Islamicist is a person with a living faith in God who uses Orientalist principles. And um, they held, the, the, the um, Islamicists held that much in the Bible that is truth admitted in the Quran and the Bible came through, came through the Bible, to the Quran. Now, for example, and I thought I would just give you an example here. Um, about the Orientalists and Christian Islamists as well, 
studying the term Allah, because this has been, I will bring this up again, this coming lecture. It's so important, so important, because Islam, uh, based on the unity of God, is, is foundationally Deuteronomy 6.4, as well, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Now, linguistically, Allah for the deity was imported from the Aramaic term, Allah. And Aramaic was the lang language used by Jews and Christians in the Arab Peninsula and North Mesopotamia. North Mesopotamia. And we'll re review this. And so you had... Allah in Aramaic is the cognate of the Hebrew singular, Eloha, and the honorific plural, Elohim. I will say honorific plural, not plural of number, but plural of majesty. And you see this word again and again, where in this construct, where you have Hebrew, Eloha, Aramaic, Allah. Arabic Allah. And so you have these cognates linguistically pointing to the one God. Now the textual factor, um, the name Allah, by the way, in used in Arabic terms, uh, predates Islam, and you find it in ancient translations of the Old Testament. So portions of the Arabic Bible known in the 5th and, and 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries use the term Allah for God. The origin of the name of Allah may be from the Abrahamic tribes. The Jews in North Arabia used El for the deity, and Il is in Arabic, is in a cognate of El. The whole argument there is to demonstrate that the term Allah comes from the biblical term in Hebrew, El. Il in Arabic, El in Hebrew. It has nothing to do with the idea of the moon god. Now, the Orientalists also were interested in studying the meaning of Allah. And they noted well, and I think carefully, that, um, that the names of God, the beautiful names of God, um, the 99 names of God best describe God, Allah, in the Quran. And of course, you don't find all these names in the Quran, but you do find them in, 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 the, in, the, in the hadith, in the writings. But that um, his God in his omnipotence, un, his power to reward and punish, and his attributes, and his compassion and clemency, Halim, are all found in these beautiful names, al-Bashir, the all-seeing, al-Hakam, the judge, al-Adil, the just. By the way, you find that same concept both in the Quran and the Bible. Al-Latif, the gentle, the, the knower of subtleties. Al-Kabir, the all-aware. Al-Halim, the forbearing. Al-Azam, the incomparably great. Al al Gafur, the forgiving, and so forth. I didn't go through all of those. But next time, I'm going to have a detailed study, both from the, both from the Quran, as well as from the Old Testament. And you'll see how many of these are actually identified attributes of God in the Old Testament as well. And this, this was pointed out, this study was pointed out by by the Orientalists. Eventually, it came down to the fact, though, that the essence of Allah is the unity of God. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4, 
writ large. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And the unity of God is, is the essence uh, they felt. And I also feel. And the struggle for monotheism against paganism in Arabia was also present in the teaching of Jewish tribes and the obscure sects of Hanifs prior to Muhammad. And the teaching of Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, hear O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, was remembered in the Quran in all of these concepts. And, uh, with, and the Quran witnesses to the intense zeal for the unity of God, say praise belongs to God and peace be upon his servants whom he has chosen. Is, is God best or what they associate with him? He who created the heavens and the earth and sends down on you rain from heaven. Is there a God with God? Nay, but they are a people who make peers with him. Of course, that's that sort of 2761 follow. So also the terms that are used in association with God indicates his unity. Wahid, Ahad, Auhad, Mutawahid. And they, these are all used in definition of Allah. And they signify according to the expositor, the Quranic expositors. He who is one in essence, having no like, nor peer, nor second. So that, that's more or less unpacking the essence and the meaning that uh, the Orientalists found in the unity of God. We're now going to turn to what uh, Sir William Muir, Sir Sagan Ahmed Khan, and William Golsack uh, did in comparing the concepts of God and other theological concepts in their writings. <laughs> 